as we start to uh, as we start to turn our cameras off from that session, uh, imagine if we were live and in person, we would be uh, inviting people live and in person to walk up on stage. But instead, we're asking people to turn cameras on. Uh, so we're going into our second session of the day, and we've got some great speakers here with us. A uh, spectacular mayor from the city of Sedona, Arizona, a place I've told her ad nauseum how much I enjoyed that I still remember the name of the driver of my uh, pink Jeep tour back in 1986 and the name of the German uh, bakery that we I went to afterwards. Love the city of Sedona, Arizona. Uh, mayor Sandy, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, one of the best darn uh, uh, travel and tourism leaders in the United States, uh, Candace Carr Strauss. She's uh, the CEO of uh, Big Sky, and uh, she's got uh, some incredible discussion uh, to talk to us about uh, with their success on short-term rental regulations that they've had there and the massive amount of success of gaining compliance and gaining uh, uh, really successful uh, you know, uh, activity from the short-term rental industry and how they've been able to balance that. Alex Jakubiak, from, uh, he's the revenue manager from Vail, Colorado. They've done a great job in Vail. Uh, and uh, really successful trying to balance this issue uh, there as well. Uh, with both Visit Big Sky and Vail, one of the reasons that they are successful, and by the way, with Sedona as well, uh, is because they uh, work with Lodging Revs and Tyler Fisher from Lodging Revs. Uh, Tyler's going to speak to us a little bit about what he does across the country. One of the things that he does very well is find compliance. When we had our in-person uh, conference last year in Austin, we were uh, identifying best practice solutions and talking about them. And one of the things we found with uh, Tyler and his work with lodging revs is consistently, he's able to find 98, 99% compliance for local rules and local taxes and getting people into a program uh, and creating a successful outcome. So we're gonna speak with these folks here uh, for the next little bit uh, and talk to us a, a little bit about uh, what they found as far as success goes. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you guys are doing well. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Now, Candace, if I, if you don't mind, can I take a quick second and just ask you really quickly? Um, uh, do you, I think you have an interesting announcement uh, that maybe not everybody uh, in the travel industry knows. Can I put you on the spot to uh, uh, maybe just uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and where you're going after all these years with Visit Big Sky? Absolutely. Well, I see uh, Madam Mayor smiling there. Um, I'm about to join the team in Sedona at the Sedona Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau as of February 22nd, officially in market. So already working to meet many of my tourism ecosystem stakeholders throughout the market. And I actually met my team yesterday for the first time, which was really exciting. And so I look forward to making that transition. Obviously, it's bittersweet, but uh, our communities teach us that adventure awaits and we can't not answer the call. So thanks for allowing me to share that news, Matt. Well, and one of the interesting things here is, uh, you know, maybe we could say hop on a Smart City Policy Group uh, conference and get yourself a new job. So that's great. Uh, we're excited for you. I think you're going to bring great things to Sedona. So uh, that's wonderful. And so, Candace, while we're visiting with you here for a quick moment, let's just keep the conversation on you and uh, talk to you. Also talk to you a little bit about this issue. Uh, you know, we we jumped into an international discussion there very quickly earlier, and partially because of the time. Uh, you know, those folks were nice enough to take a call at the very end of their workday. So, you know. Um, uh, we didn't want to keep them up too late, but uh, this is a neat way to jump into a conversation, especially for our uh, U.S.-based audience uh, that is listening here today. One of the challenges that we have in the United States consistently is some of the things that we discussed with our friends from Europe. How do you engage stakeholders? How do you get people to kind of understand that a program exists and we, we want to create a good experience for travelers coming to our community? Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you view that and how that's worked for you in, uh, in Big Sky. Well, I, I think we could also hearken back to what Secretary Schauer said with New Mexico, Matt, at, in her introductory speech. Um, it's about collaboration, right? The C's, we keep hearing these words, collaboration, communication, community engagement of all of our stakeholders in that system. And so, you know, I think what the common denominator of all of our destinations and communities is really this underlying driving force of the visitor economy and how can everyone benefit from that, from not only the visitor, but the local resident, 
the small business owner, the big business owner, as well as our public government entities who are funding our communities, many times from that infrastructure standpoint. So um, it's really about getting everyone to the table to have the conversation, getting everybody on that same page and understanding that it, it's not a win-lose situation. We have to try to find the balance where everybody wins, but that's not easy. As, as that's why we're here today. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't that great? I mean, that's isn't it so funny that the, the uh, discussion that we have is so similar, whether you're in Porto, Portugal, or Big Sky, uh, that, you know, what, what you have said is very similar to what that council member Ricardo Valente said, is that there can be a win-win. Uh, and so much of it comes from dialogue and that community uh, stakeholder engagement. You know, there is challenge with getting uh, community and stakeholders involved and understanding uh, uh, the, the various levels of, uh, of government rules and, and, and the, the objectives that you might have locally. You guys had some tourism community objectives that you put in place around uh, economic revenue, but you also want to make sure that you're preserving your neighborhoods and preserving what makes Big Sky special. Talk to us a little bit about how you balance those, the, the, the balance between uh, the community objectives. Well, it's a, it's a constant conversation with that balance. Um, so what we've done, again, is really uh, formulate uh, an infrastructure for continued dialogue among all entities. Um, we are working day in and day out, hand in hand with our local resort tax mechanism, Matt, which is our government funding entity. Uh, we levy a 4% luxury tax on goods and services in our community which is really funding our infrastructure build out. Uh, we're unincorporated and straddle two counties. And so um, to have that relationship and that partnership with the funding mechanism that is fueled by the visitor economy. So um, again, everything goes hand in hand. It's an ecosystem and one benefits the other and vice versa. It's, not, it's a very symbiotic, not uh, parasitic relationship. Right. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, the failure to recognize that quality of life for our residents, the restaurants and retail that we have, in particular, in particular our air development, you know, our air routes that allow our, our residents to go out and to these other destinations represented on this panel with me, as well as to bring our visitors in, is all a function of that balance between a visitor economy and a sustainable community. So um, the, the the key to success is really continued conversation. And it's, um, it's arduous, you know, you have to be extremely diligent and it's every day. It is, right? I mean, that continued conversation is, is every day. I mean, there's no better way of, I've heard somebody boil it down in, in recent memory, that's perfect. Um, you know, the, uh, the challenge often that we have in different destination, uh, vacation destination cities is how do you balance housing as well um, in, in the whole mix. Have you, have you heard a lot of discussion in Big Sky about affordable housing or housing stock as being a concern? Absolutely. Um, affordable workforce housing is our single most critical need in Big Sky. It was pre-COVID. Um, um, as vice chair of the Big Sky Community Housing Trust, which just was birthed out uh, this year in, in June, um, we just launched our first deed-restricted uh, subdivision for affordable workforce housing. Um, COVID has brought on, you know, some of that fleeing from the urban center that we've sold over a billion with a B dollars of real estate in the past three months. So um, that pain point for our locals being pushed out of some of that housing inventory is real. Um, but it, again, it takes all of these partners, public, private, and nonprofit to come to the table to make things happen, to provide solutions back for that. So the our Meadow View project, for example, is publicly funded through our resort tax mechanism in part. It's partially funded through philanthropic efforts of our many private community foundations. And then in addition, you have um, private individuals as well making donations. So we're working with the nonprofit housing trust. Um, I think to be intentional uh, and be willing to have conversations about funding mechanisms for affordable workforce housing with all of those partners that I just mentioned is, is the key to our success in that project. So you had a lot of work with the kind of the tax collection efforts that are going on in your community. And you know, like so many different destination marketing organizations, you know that you need uh, every dollar, especially right now during COVID. So many of our viewers are 
uh, watching from destination marketing organizations where they work. Uh, we had an overwhelming number of uh, people from different DMOs across the United States sign up for this conference. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, kind of working with the tax collection team uh, and the success that you find to be able to drive that revenue uh, to the community. Absolutely. I, I think COVID is a perfect example of the amazing relationship that our two organizations have been able to forge over the past you know, four years that I've been in destination. Um, we just launched about two weeks ago a free community-wide surveillance testing program for our local workforce and any community member who wants it. It's Monday and Tuesday of every week throughout the entire winter season. Um, and those tests will be conducted. They're currently being picked up and dropped back off at our offices. Again, hand in hand working with that local resort tax mechanism, because as we sat down and started scenario planning on what could our summer look like in COVID, but more importantly, what, what would the upcoming winter look like? Because winter is our main driving force at the moment. Um, we needed to ensure that we would have a winter uh, for those $8 million in annual resort tax collections, a majority, nearly 70% is collected from our winter season. So what are the different scenarios we could possibly see? We saw the complete shutdown mid-March, which obviously that's not something we ever wanted to see happen again. Um, but what were those other avenues and how could we work together to ensure uh, that we had the best outcome possible? And with this testing program, we watched over the summer Yellowstone National Park and the National Park Service implement this type of program. So it not only gave confidence to the traveling public to put out that you had protocols and processes in place to take them in safely as a visitor, if they still wish to come, but it showed outcomes from those processes and policies and procedures that were working and keeping people safe. And so I think it's a perfect demonstration of that true partnership. And if we didn't have that relationship going into the crisis, there's no way that we could have had this quick and nimble and flexible response um, that, that's really supporting our community right now. That's great. Well, and so you've also had a little bit of success working with uh, a group that helps you achieve compliance. Uh, I think one of those people is Tyler, uh, who's on the call here today, would you say? Is that uh, uh, my, my, my constant uh, adoration for the work that Tyler and his team have, has done? Uh, I, I, I was just in shock when I met them last year, and then I started to talk to so many communities that were so impressed with how successful their efforts were. Obviously, it sounds like you've been successful in, in, in Big Sky. Yes, we have. And so it goes back to that communication. Um, I think in the earlier panel, it was mentioned, as well as um, Cabinet Secretary Showers, clear expectations, right, of what people, either a business or a visitor or a homeowner, clear expectations and continually communicating that out. So again, in working with our resort tax partner, um, we are constantly sharing out the information about being a registered business, about tax compliance, changes in our ordinance, um, just reinforcing um, their deadlines and, and protocols. Um, it, it's not a disconnect from us as a tourism stakeholder management organization from them. Uh, we just come into the equation from different, different mm -hmm. perspectives. And so, but again, we need to carry their message forward. And at the same time, we hope that they carry our uh, message of the importance of the visitor economy forward as well. Right. Well, uh, Candace, thank you so much for, uh, for those thoughts. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and, you know, if you, of course, you're going to stick with us for, for a little bit, and we might come back and ask you a few more questions. Uh, Alex, you're the town of Vail Revenue Manager. Um, I'm sure that's, you know, a, a job that has a variety of different dimensions to it. But one thing that you're, you're lucky, like Candace, uh, you live in a spectacularly beautiful destination. Um, you know, I, I think I can, I can t safe, safely tell you that so many of us who are uh, watching from different destinations here during COVID, not being able to travel as much as we would like to, we're probably a little bit jealous of where you are right now. Uh, I'm sure there are some local folks that are skiing. Are the, are, are the ski, uh, ski slopes operating right now? Uh, yes, they are. I believe we just opened some more terrain today. We're getting some great snow right now, which is awesome. Um, so we're very excited and I've been out there myself a few times uh, just to get the legs ready for the season. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, you know, we're, we're excited for a, a, a return to the travel and tourism industry and that so many of us will be able to come to Vail. Uh, it, in the, it certainly hopefully in the second half of 2021, if not a little earlier as uh, things start to settle down. 
Well, let's talk to you a little bit, a little bit about what you guys have done. Uh, you guys have had an, an evolving discussion of, to your ordinance and, and you've been pursuing a, a path to getting your, your local ordinance right. Talk to us a little bit about how that's gone. gone. Have you guys, uh, have you looked into the ordinance and then tinkered with it over time, changing different elements of it based on what was working and what is not? Uh, absolutely. You know, it's definitely an evolving thing, an evolving beast. Um, you know, we get a lot of feedback from our community and it's just so important to stay engaged with, um, you know, all the community stakeholders, whether it's the property managers, the property owners, and our visitors. Um, you know, in Vail, we view short-term rentals as such a vital part of the economy. They've always been a part of our uh, sort of lodging base even since we were incepted in 1962. Um, so we've always strived to find a balance between making it work for those stakeholders, the business side of things, and also for our community as a whole and maintaining things like uh, neighborhoods and you know cleanliness and things like that. Um, we definitely have had an evolving discussion around um, some of the requirements in our ordinance um, that sort of reflect those. Um, you know, we require all property managers and property owners to sign an agreement and um, about good neighbor guidelines. Essentially, it's a document that has um, just sort of some assumptions and requirements for visitors, what we expect when they are in the town of Vail. Um, just respectful of their neighbors, you know, minding noise ordinances, minding trash regulations and things like that. Um, and that list has definitely evolved over time to reflect the complaints we receive in time. Um, another aspect of our ordinance that's changed over time is the decriminalization of our ordinance. Um, when we first went live with the short-term rental regulation, um, the only way we could really enforce it was through the port system, which was quite burdensome and difficult to get compliance with. Um, you know, getting feedback on that, we found, um, or we decided ultimately to decriminalize those violations and move to a fine issuance model. Um, and that's definitely helped us achieve greater compliance. We're up to, we estimate about 95% compliance at this time. Um, so those are just a few of the things that we've definitely changed. Um, and then a lot of what we changed too is our internal practice. Um, you know, how do we approach uh, the property managers and the community about these ordinances? Um, you know, what communication channels work best? Um, thinking about how can we get in touch with people? Lodging Revs has been a great partner for that. Um, they have built-in notification systems and we do a lot of direct emails in addition to our more traditional communication channels. Incredible. Now, so you think you're at uh, 95, maybe even more uh, uh, level of compliance right now. Um, do you think, where do you think you were a few years ago before you really engaged in a program? Uh, when we began, we estimated we were at about 40% compliance wow. um, in terms of sales tax collections, as well as licensing and registrations. Wow. And 40% even, I would, I would argue is a little on the high side for many of the people who are watching here today is so often when we look at different communities around the country, they can be in the single dig digits. Uh, so they can have a really tough time achieving even a remote reasonable level of compliance. It's, it's tough, but 40% uh, certainly is not 95. And I know your community would probably prefer you to be at, uh, at 95 and close to a hundred. So that, that gets you the, the level of, you know, people following local rules, but also, of course, uh, uh, remitting those necessary taxes, those obligated tax dollars. Yes, absolutely. You mentioned the notification. Uh, how does that notification process work for you? Talk to us a little bit about how that's going and, and um, uh, you know, the success there. Absolutely. Um, you know, whenever we make any change to the ordinance, we definitely um, try to publish that, you know, in the, whether it's in the local press, we do a lot of direct mailings uh, to communicate any changes in uh, our expectation or regulation of STRs. Um, but then also we're always monitoring listings and we are doing direct uh, communications with properties we find who are not in compliance. Um, you know, Vail, we always take the approach of education first. Our first notice is always uh, just informing the property owner or property manager that they of what the requirement is to be registered in bail um, and what compliance looks like and what we expect of them before we move into sort of a more uh, deeper level of enforcement or a fine issuance at that point. Um, our ordinances really have evolved as well to reflect um, or to really give us sort of an actionable base of what we can find or 
uh, enforce on, um, you know, if you, we require people to post their registration number in their listings and things like that. And that really helps us to gain that compliance over time. Right. Yeah. That's, that's certainly one that's often, often discussed, uh, that posting of the uh, registration number. Um, and then, you know, how, how, as far as your level of reporting going, uh, obviously you're getting your, the reporting about the uh, you know, kind of regular success rate of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the program itself. But then I'm, I'm sure that you're as a government staff person also kind of you know, expected to report to your city council and to the community as a whole about the success of the program. Talk to us a little bit about that. How's your, uh, your reporting process? How does that work for you? Sure. We um, are always tracking that compliance rate. That's kind of our key indicator uh, for everything we do. We want to make sure that, um, you know, as new properties come online uh, or start listing in the community, that we're really seeing um, what that number is and what the compliance rate is. You know, echoing kind of what Candace was saying, what you guys were talking about before, um, affordable housing is such an important issue here. And we're really tracking our bed base and seeing, um, you know, what, what sort of inventory is moving between long-term housing and short-term housing. I think that's kind of been one of the big factors that we've been looking at in our reporting lately. Um, and then also, of course, we track our sales tax that we receive. We have a sales tax on lodging, of course, in the town. Um, and that's really important for us to track and make sure that the compliance there um, is steady. Um, you know, kind of, I think those are kind of the important factors that we monitor. Yeah, no, of course. You know, it's uh, it's interesting. One of the things that we see, and uh, I think Ricardo Valente mentioned it from uh, Porto, uh, is the challenge when you have neighboring communities that don't adopt successful ordinances. You have adopted a successful ordinance. You continue to work on it to make sure that it's successful and that you're achieving that high degree of compliance. Uh, but do you see yourself, are you faced with any kind of challenge if any of your neighboring communities adopt something that is you know, hard for people to understand and hard for people to follow? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think we, we mostly see it when uh, people move to do business in the town. Uh, there's maybe some confusion if they've come from a place that doesn't have an STR regulation or a differing regulation. Um, they might think that that's applicable here. Um, and it's just that education piece that we really work on in communicating with those, um, you know, new businesses and new property management companies that do crop up. Um, there's such an influx over time. It's such a big sector of our economy here um, that there's really a lot of um, variation year to year, even month to month with who is uh, listing rentals and who is managing the, the rental process here. Um, but we definitely have uh, some different, differing regulations throughout the state that I think um, it does cause some confusion. Yeah, no, it's, that is a challenge. We call it regional depression of compliance, uh, and it's unfortunate. Uh, there's many different communities, our friends in the Pocono area, uh, I think are a challenge with that, even though, of course, you know, I think it's, uh, it's good for different locales to put their goals in place and make sure to achieve local goals. Um, in a tight area, it's something interesting to look at if there's such sweeping changes from community to community that it actually drives down overall compliance. We guys are definitely doing things well in Vail, and I uh, wanted to switch gears for just a quick second and talk to uh, Tyler about what they're doing in Vail, what you're doing in Vail, Tyler, and what you're doing in other communities as well. Uh, Tyler Fisher with Lodging Revs, uh, you're actually, I didn't even think about this, you're pivoting from a Vail uh, uh, destination to talk to a company that uh, was founded in Colorado. Uh, you were founded by a CEO who was a former CFO of a destination city. So I think your, C your CEO, Erin Neer, is so terrific because she really understands that intersection of policy and the need to um, address policy, but also the importance of a local vibrant uh, tourism uh, and travel economy. Uh, you've been working at this for quite a long time with cities all around the United States. You've been very successful at this yourself, Tyler, and I think part of that is because of uh, the uh, path that was put in place by your CEO uh, to put together such a great company. One of the things that you've worked on, Tyler, is education programs, uh, making sure that people you know, understand these rules. We keep hearing that time and time again. That's a common theme about making sure that people are understanding of these rules through an education program. Talk to us about what you've seen and what's successful and how you think uh, other communities might want to address the same issue. 
Sure. Thank you, Matt. And thank you so much for, for having me. And I think what Alex and Candace have, have touched on so far around this education and this messaging component is first and foremost, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity where people just don't know. I mean, you have your property managers that are very astute, the professionals in the industry. So they know the outlines of how to proceed and become compliant, remit taxes, complete registration, uh, have an emergency point of contact. But you also have um, an ever-growing group of short-term rental owners and operators who might be second home owners or just live in the area and might not have that direct connection with proper policies and processes. So just like Alex said, that the first notification, so you know, first of all, you have to identify, know where these short-term rentals are, and then be able to notify them of the appropriate course of action. And that first notice is going out, is very curtailed to help move them along in the process, you know, really propelling them along in their journey. Here's what you need to do. Here's your specific deficiencies, and here's how you need to address these to become compliant. Uh, but also that same standpoint, you want to hold them accountable too. So when you're looking at sending out these notices and come from that educational standpoint, you really want to say, hey, you know, we've identified you as operating a short-term rental and here's our proof. You know, so really saying, uh, here's your ad listing, here are some of the dates we've seen, however you want to structure that, that letter. And it's different from community to community across, you know, the country because each community has different capabilities as as uh, the mayor will will speak to too in Arizona it's definitely a little bit different uh, but you, you definitely want to hold them accountable and show them that they have uh, they have to buy into this process you know this process is there for the good of the community that's also try that's also there to draw the tourist traffic that is creating these booking revenues for you too so I think you know that's such a critical part and that's, that's more of a messaging notification component too. There's a lot of education that goes in upfront when you're engaging with the public. Uh, you know, whether it's going through a task force process where you're trying to come up with the ordinances and how to proceed, you know, that, that kind of facilitate, facilitation of key stakeholders, there's a lot of education that goes in, in there too. Uh, so I think, you know, there's, there's a fine balance. And I, I often say too, it, it can take a, a really tremendous jump if you have the right person facilitating that that engagement with all those key stakeholders and i, I know you've you've been in that role before matt so <laughs> for sure you know it's funny uh we we do have a, a background in facilitation and uh uh it is a challenge you know this is a a group that we put together made up of former policy makers so engaging in community dialogue is something that we do uh, but it is a challenge. And, you know, one of the things that we're hearing from Candace, uh, you know, and from Alex, from yourself and from the folks uh, that were in part of our international discussion is it's a dialogue that you have to continue to have to make sure that you're successful. Uh, so you have to have that kind of consistent buy in. So speaking of buy in, you know, and Tyler, you and I have talked about this before, uh, getting buy in you could include both you know, your local operators, but also maybe the other other elements in the industry as well, making sure that they understand that, you know, rules are being applied at the local level and we want to make sure they're successful. Um, I'm a big believer in start with the foundation of the professional property manager because they're paid to make sure that their uh, clients, the people that they represent, uh, are achieving local compliance with all things. Uh, and then you can be successful with a good, strong foundation and then build from there. Uh, but uh, talk to us a little bit about how you view buy-in, uh, Tyler. How does that, uh, you've seen this in other cities. How does it work and when does it work well? Sure, and I think you're, you're spot on with the analogy of kind of the foundation with the property managers. So we, you know, we engage with a multitude of, of cities and counties and states across the country. And as we come in to help, you know, provide resources, best practices, and also technology solutions, you know, we're meeting each client where they are. And each client is in a different process and a different stage. And that aspect of creating buy-in varies greatly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But I'd say the, the common denominator is really focusing on the property managers. So the property managers, if we come into a community to help support compliance, registration, 
uh, revenue collection and hotline services, you know, we are coming in from the standpoint of he, we're here to deliver the best solution for you as an administration entity, as a government agency, but also we're here for the community too. So we're here to help support your community. And the property managers, they live in the community. So they're the locals. They see this day in, day out. You know, they are essentially, I, I like to say brand ambassadors almost, you know, so Candace, I know that you definitely have uh, a couple key people on, even on your board that are property managers and Big Sky and Vale too. You have a, a tremendous allocation of property managers there. And that can often give you a little boost in initial compliance. A lot of cities, when we come in, you know, they might be 40 to 50% compliant if they do not have a high percentage of property managers. The more property managers they have, that initial compliance rate is going to be somewhere 55 to 60% if they're more property managers. So having the property manager kind of as the cor cornerstone to help wrap in this conversation and see what's feasible when you're talking to ordinances or how to best deliver certain messaging around tax compliance or even to test out your solution. You know, I, I often say property managers love working with us, you know, because we not only support the local government, we're there supporting the property managers too. Uh, so I think that's a key aspect of creating buy-in. And it's also, you know, I think uh, Sedona, Candace, <clears throat> Candace and Big Sky and Alex and Vale too, all of these groups, it, it's by no means one individual making this happen. It's a collaborative effort as everybody's been saying. And it's a lot of different departments coming together and it's, but it's still putting a single face forward. So you're, you're coming together to represent a, a goal driven purpose as a singular entity. So when you, 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 know, you are portraying to the general public through presentations, through announcements or notifications that, hey, this process is gonna help our community get better results, you know, better economic resolution as an economic driver, but also a more responsive instance, like if you are implementing a hotline like they have in Vail, uh, where you're trying to get community engagement and give the general public an outlet to report any complaints and then have the immediate resolution take place there too and be able to track that and then report back to city council is is critical too. So from the, the I guess a, a kind of long-winded answer from the top down, 3,000 foot view, really having that singular foot forward in presentation to the general public and property owners uh, really goes a long way. And that they have to realize too that by becoming compliant and remitting the taxes that they are collecting from uh, their guests or paying the fees for registration to go through this registration process, they're helping to fund this this perpetual process. They're creating the community that's going to continue to drive traffic to their short-term rentals. You know, when you're talking about collecting that occupancy tax or resort tax, bed tax, you know, that's going in large part to the destination marketing organization that is driving uh, tourists to that destination and staying in short-term rentals. So that that can be one of the education components that can help create additional buy-in too. Yeah. And then finally, just real quick, uh, reports. You pro you provide reporting to different clients. You probably see success with reporting. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. And I think Alex and Candace have definitely touched on that. And Eduardo, Eduardo on the last uh, session also, you know, trying to establish ordinances and set up procedures and registrations without having a full grasp on the number of short-term rentals in your community or having the specific data on the number of complaints that are coming through and seeing where those complaints are, you know, it, you're really not putting the best foot forward to craft these ordinances and get the best end results. So getting the data on where the short-term rentals are, where the complaints are coming from, uh, where the revenues are coming from, you know, I think that's such a key aspect in the early stages of decision-making. And then for the long term too, when you're looking at, you know, Alex and his team having the capability to continually inform uh, the town, town manager and the town council on how these projects are wor working and how to adjust those ordinances accordingly, you know, having the, the data that you can tie it back to is, is critical. Yeah, data, data is certainly important. You know, we have so much anecdotal information that's out there and unfortunately some bad actors also who will um, utilize 
data or massage data in such a way so that it's not really reflective of, uh, uh, of the real story. And so that's something that you certainly help with. Uh, that's great, Tyler. We really appreciate that. So Mayor Sandy, uh, as I, I mentioned, you can always tell I'm enthusiastic to jump on the phone with you or, or a Zoom call because Sedona is such an incredibly beautiful place. Tyler was mentioning a little bit about local rules and you know creating local rules around this industry. And you were just quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, about uh, local rules or your challenges with creating local rules for yourselves there in, uh, in Sedona. Talk to us a little bit about that and your view of the importance of local rules. Well, I have been listening to the entire uh, conference today, and I have to say, I am, I'm more and more envious of people who have local rules, because we basically don't have local rules. <laughs> so we've got very little we can enforce. And that is because of the governor has decided in 2016, the governor and the legislature passed some uh, legislation that told cities and towns in Arizona they cannot ban short-term rentals. Now, I had no interest in banning short-term rentals, but the fact is Sedona had one in place when I was first elected mayor. I was never necessarily on board with it, but it was, it was what we were doing, and, and, and so that's the way it was when I was elected. Then in 2016, as I say, the governor decided, okay, we're not going to allow bans on short-term rentals. So that was the end of that. However, he also said, not only can we not ban them, we can't regulate them either. And all I have heard is discussions about how, what a great idea it is to be proactive in taking management steps with short-term rentals. Well, we can't do that. We literally cannot do that in Arizona. We have no way to do that. And consequently, we went from an outright ban to doors wide open. And that doesn't work. They are totally right when they say, you need to stay ahead of it. You need to be, be, be proactive. You need to be talking to all the players. It, didn't, it has not happened in Arizona and because Sedona is a, a small city, we're a city of about 10,300, uh, probably growing a little bit. Our, I suspect our census numbers will be up a bit, but not a lot. Uh, so we're a small city with limited resources. We are, because Sedona is, after all, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Sedona, it is the most beautiful place on earth in so many ways. We are a tourism city whether we want to be or not, we are. We have to accept that. I do accept it fully. I welcome it. It's a wonderful economic engine, but it can be overwhelming at times. And when the governor threw the doors wide open to short-term rentals, I believe we had them even while we had a ban, we had some short-term rentals under the radar. But once the doors were thrown open, now we have gone from probably what I would, I can only guess was maybe a couple hundred under the radar in the area to about 743 in the city and another 430 plus in the immediate surrounding areas around the city outside city limits. So it's had a major effect uh, on, our, on our neighborhoods for sure. And also on what everyone else has talked about and that is affordable housing, which we had a huge problem with as long as I've lived here, frankly, which is 49 years I've been in Sedona. So, and the cause of it is, the underlying cause of it is, the cost of land is high. It's always been high. And so trying to achieve affordable housing, I can't tell you how excited I am to hear Candace talk about her, her, her housing trust fund that she's, she worked on in Big Sky because we really need something like that here. So I, I'm very excited to, to have her coming and maybe we can get something started outside city government, frankly. I think it works best outside city government. But it's always a challenge. And yes, it's, it's ironic that the, that the workers we need to house are the workers of our major economic driver, tourism. Right. These are not people who can afford expensive houses. So they aren't the ones who live in Sedona. And so our, our affordability gap in Sedona has been the highest in the state for a very long time. It, it's a very difficult problem to deal with. 
And so we do need to be able to have some sort of regulations and rules so we can manage. <laughs> I mean, right now, the only rule we really have, and Tyler knows about this because Tyler has helped us get our data. And that is we have been given permission to require short-term rentals to give us an emergency contact. Now, mind you, when uh, the governor made his decision to throw the doors open, we made an effort to try to say, okay, all short-term rentals need a business license. It didn't seem like an outlandish demand to me, but we did it. And an outfit called the Goldwater Institute came after us and said, no, you can't do that because Arizona also passed some legislation that said, you can't pass any rules, any city ordinances that are against state law. And state law in Arizona tells us that we can't treat short-term rentals differently from long-term rentals. Well, I'm sorry, but they are. They're, they're very different. Short-term rentals are not passive income, long-term rentals are. I'm, I'm not interested in licensing long-term rentals, but we were interested in licensing short-term rentals, which are actually businesses. It, it didn't seem like anything that outlandish to us, but we were stopped and we had to stop doing it. So <clears throat> we can ask for an emergency contact and that's about it. So, so yes, I would love to be able to put rules in place and to try to reach out and, and work with short-term owners on on rules and how what's reasonable and what's not. We are not interested in very strict regulations as we heard from, from the folks from Portugal. I'm not interested in very, very strict regulations. Some of the citizens probably are, but I don't think that works. I know it doesn't work. We would love to be able to collaborate with some kind of short-term lodging group to talk about what we might be able to institute that would be good, but we can't, there's no, <laughs> We have nothing to talk about at the moment because we're not allowed to do right. it. Right. That, that's our dilemma. So you you spoke a little bit about the data uh, that Tyler had helped out with and being able to get that emergency contact. Has that um, effort gone been successful? It has been successful. We have seventy five percent compliance, uh, and we're we're sending out another mailing. We just sent out another mailing, I believe, to try to to make that better, but. Um, as I said, it's a small, it's a small step actually. Right. And frankly, we don't even know how good the information is that we got. The other thing uh, is that we have had um, lodging revs set up a hotline for us and we are starting to get complaints. And the other thing that I'll mention is in Sedona, we are very data-based and we have been ever since our city manager, Justin Clifton came to us from Colorado and he is a very uh, data-driven manager. He instituted all kinds of data collection efforts in the city so that we can make reasonable decisions. And I think it's, it's wonderful. And I totally agree. I've heard a lot of talk about it today, about how important it is in, in dealing with short-term rentals. And so that's, that is what Lodging Revs is doing for us, is identifying properties and, and helping us to communicate with them as best we can. But right now, as I say, until the legislature decides we can treat short-term rentals differently, there's not a whole lot we can do, but we are doing what we can. I'm sorry, I may have lost track of your question, Matt. No, no, no. In fact, you touched base on something that I love to uh, point out to people, which is the hotline. You know, um, so many communities don't understand the importance of a hotline and just offering the community a hotline like that. Uh, they also, I think, I think what I hear from so many of our communities when wherever we're out in the, in the world speaking to destination marketing organizations or to city leaders, um, it seems like overwhelmingly they don't want to operate their own hotline, especially after they've given it a try. So it's nice to hear that you've uh, got a group that operates one for you and that it's a successful yeah. uh, opportunity to give people a place to, you know, address any immediate concerns. And then, of course, you have a way to contact the operator through that emergency point of contact. So that's great. Yes. Well, yes. good. Well, I think, you know, what everybody has heard here today is that dialogue is a, a key to success. And, and Mayor Sandy, even, you know, in, in your discussion, you you spoke a little bit about the importance of, you know, looking at data and talking about, uh, uh, you know, engaging in dialogue with, uh, with the community as a way to find success. One question, 
that I, I wanted to ask, and I've come back to a couple of times uh, throughout the day today, and I will over the next couple of days. And so I'll start with you, uh, Candice, and just real quick, but just kind of flash answer. But do you think that awareness is a hurdle for people uh, that uh, uh, oftentimes it's not that they want to skirt the rules, it's just they're unaware. Do you think that's a hurdle for you in Vail? Or, I'm sorry, in Big Sky? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Yes. Uh, Alex, do you think that's the same in Vail? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. And then Tyler, you've worked with so many different cities. I mean, it, 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 would you say that's the same in, all, in your experiences across the United States? It's just a, a lack of awareness and not really typically a, a desire to skirt the rules. I'd say with the vast majority, for sure, you do have the one-off participant that um, you kind of need to escalate. And I think the way that Vail is doing it with their citation structure, I think that that works quite well. Well, and the great thing for you is I kind of walked into that one, <laughs> is that you are able to identify anybody who's not part of a program for the communities where you work. So with Candace in Big Sky, uh, with Vale, and then uh, with Sedona, you know, you're able to help people achieve the local rules. And to, to, to Mayor Sandy, to your point, the limited ability that you have to place uh, any kind of local restrictions, in your case, just the hotline or, or not the hotline, the, uh, the emergency contact. But uh, you are able to help uh, people achieve those goals, uh, Tyler. That's great. Well, to all of you, thank you. I, I think that all of the audience watching can look to Big Sky, uh, can look to uh, Vail as successful models, can really hear the messaging uh, from uh, Mayor Sandy. Uh, and then uh, one, one important message that uh, Mayor Sandy uh, got across that I heard uh, that I hope everybody else did, it's important to be data-driven. Uh, Sedona is certainly a data-driven uh, community that wants to achieve uh, compliance if, uh, if they were allowed to create those local rules. Thank you all for joining us today. This is a, a great discussion from you. I really appreciate this session. And I think for anybody uh, who would like to reach out to the folks who participated with this discussion today, uh, feel free to reach out to us at info at smartcitypolicygroup.com.